happy Independence Day. Today is a day that we as a nation celebrate our freedom. Freedom that so many people stepped in in a moment in time to secure for us. And we celebrate people on this day, the Washingtons and the Adams and the Hamiltons and the Franklins, these great leaders of our nation that stepped in in a major moment and did something spectacular. But we also celebrate on this day some unlikely people, some people that maybe never expected to be a part of this great freedom story of our nation. People like Betsy Ross, or Abigail Adams, or even Paul Revere. People who found themselves at a moment in time in a situation where they had to choose what are they going to do. And because they and many others like them chose to rise to the occasion, we celebrate our freedoms on a day like today. Well, as we jump into our text, as we continue through this series, Ins and Outs, you've already heard that there are going to be three unlikely people that we are going to look at today. And what I love about this story and what I love about the Bible and what I love about our lives and our place in this world is that God uses unlikely people to do unlikely things. And the more unlikely the person, the greater God shines through. And so today we're going to look at three unlikely people. But let me set up a little bit because the truth of the matter is, why do these three people find themselves in the situation that they're in? Well, right off the bat, our text said these words, that Israel did what was wrong in the sight of the Lord. Other translations said they did what was right in their own eyes. And how many times do you and I do that? How many times do you and I make our own decisions, make our own, uh, our own choices on what we are going to do or what we're going to be or what we're going to accomplish? And what does that usually end us? Well, it's trouble, right? And so once again, Israel has done this. And it's a repeated pattern in their life, just like it's a repeated pattern in our life. We just tend to do what's right in our own eyes and forget whose eyes truly matter. And so Israel was doing what was right in their eyes. And what were they doing that was wrong? Well, they kind of abandoned God. I mean, they began to worship idols. They began to compromise. They began to try to solve their life problems on their own. Now, here's what's incredible about God. God is a fair God. He is a just God. And so many times, God will give us exactly what we want. If we want to try to solve our own problems, we want to try to fix our own life, we want to do things our way, God is a generous God and will allow us to do that. And it's not until we surrender our way that God will step in. And so we have to step back in order for God to step in. And so that's why this story is so amazing because, again, three unlikely people that God is going to do something unlikely through. And so the nation of Israel finds themselves in a place at this moment in time where they have been surrounded by an army. And this army of the Canaanites has really been oppressing them. And so they are crying out to God to deliver them. And so God introduces us to the very first unlikely person in our text today. And that is a woman by the name of Deborah. And what we know about Deborah is that Deborah definitely was an unlikely person because here she is a prophetess and she also has been chosen and appointed as a judge over the people. In that day and age, that was unheard of. I mean, in the Bible, you read so many times that it is a very male-dominated society. And so for God and the other leaders of that day to choose her and put her in that position, that is a massive statement. But here's what we know about God. God chooses people based on their character and on their gifting, not their gender. And so I can only imagine all the things that Deborah had to overcome as she was appointed as a judge, as a leader of the people in Israel. I can imagine having to overcome all of the, the thoughts and the words and the comments under people's breath about her. I got to imagine she had to overcome maybe some of her own self-doubt. But by the time we meet her here in the book of Judges, she's confident and people are coming and sitting at her feet on a regular basis to hear from her and learn from her and to take in her wisdom. But the people come to her in this story, and they are worried. They are concerned, and they want God to deliver them. And so God comes to, to Deborah and tells Deborah, I have a plan. I have a plan to set my people free because that's the truth about God is God's never going to just constantly leave us in a state of oppression. He is going to do his best to set us free. 
And so God says, I need you to go find a guy by the name of Barak and enter our next unlikely person. And so the people go and track down this guy named Barak and he's up more than likely farming. That's right. They go and find a farmer and they bring him to Deborah. And then Deborah says, God has appointed you at this time to lead an army against Sisera. Now, you got to understand who Sisera is. Sisera was the general of the Canaanite army. He had 900, 900 chariots. That's right. I know it's hard for us to imagine, but imagine that you had an army full of people with slingshots and you were going up against 900 tanks. That's what's going on here. And so Deborah tells, tells Barak that he is going to lead an army of 10,000 of Israel soldiers out against those 900 iron chariots and that God will deliver, that God will show up and grant them a victory. But here's what's so interesting in this story. As she tells him this news, Barak says to her, I'll go, but only if you go with me. Now, does that mean he's a coward? Does that mean that he was scared? I don't think it means that he was a coward or he was scared. He just had confidence in Deborah. And he knew that if Deborah was with him on the battlefield, that God would be with him as well. And so Deborah agrees, but then Deborah says these words that's so important. She says to Barak, Barak, here's the deal. Because you want to bring me, God is going to deliver a victory in this battle, not through you, but through a woman. Now, immediately we're thinking, all right, it's going to be Deborah. It's, Deborah's going to be the person that God delivers this victory through, but we're going to see another unlikely person show up in the story. Because again, God uses unlikely people to do unlikely things. And the more unlikely the person, the greater God is going to shine through. And so there's this little moment in our text that kind of just introduces us to kind of like a side story. And it's a story of, of this guy who is a Kenite. And Kenites are really the in-laws of the Israelites. Happened back during Moses' time with, with his wife and her family. And so they're camped out nearby. And in this encampment, there is a woman there by the name of J.L. And she is a housewife. And so Deborah says to Barak, it's time for us to go to battle. And she lays out this battle plan that you're going to go down and you're going to charge Sisera by the river. And so we don't really see in our text today what happens actually in the battle. But if you flip forward one chapter, there's a chapter that's titled Deborah's Song. And she recounts exactly how this battle went down. And so ultimately, here's exactly what happens. She says, all right, Brock, it's time. You charge Sisera and his 900 chariots. And so the army of 10,000 Israelites led by Barak and Deborah is there with them. They charge these 900 chariots. And the Bible says that the earth trembled and shook and opened up and waters poured out from the ground and rain came down from the sky. And so what happens when you get a lot of water and a lot of dirt? It makes mud. And so those 900 chariots were rendered absolutely useless. And they are trapped there in the mud. And those 10,000 soldiers that was led by Barak, they go and they secure a victory. But in the middle of this battle, that General Sisera, he kind of sneaks away. He sees the battlefield. He sees what's happening. He says, I am out of here. And so he goes and he hides. And he finds a very unlikely place to hide. You see, there's this encampment of these people known as the Kenites. And so he goes over to a tent and basically knocks on the door. And who answers the door? Well, a housewife by the name of Jael. And again, God uses unlikely people to do unlikely things. And the more unlikely the person, the greater God is going to shine through. And so immediately, Jael knows who this guy is. And so he says, can I come in here and can I hide? And of course, he's just been in a battle. And so he's wore out. He's thirsty and hungry and tired. And so she says, oh, come in, come in to my tent. And she invites him in and she says, are, are, are you thirsty? And he's like, oh, yes, I could use something to drink. Do you have any water? And she says, well, I, I don't have any water, but I have some milk. And I got to imagine she's offering him warm milk if you catch my drift. And she's like, yeah, I'm going to give you some warm milk. And, and then she says, man, you're, you're probably worn out and tired and you're cold because you're all wet. And, and so she wraps him up in, in a blanket and kind of tucks him in. And so there he is with his warm milk. 
There he is, kind of tucked in like a uh, snug as a bug in a rug. And then I believe she starts singing, you know, some lullabies to him, you know, uh, to put him to sleep. And he is so tired and wore out, he goes to sleep. But before he does, he says to her, hey, if anybody comes to the door, please don't let them know that I am here. And he goes to sleep. And then the Bible captures a very interesting thing, that here is this housewife. And what does she do? She goes over and she gets whatever she has, which is a giant tent peg. And she takes that tent peg and she grabs a mallet and she goes, well, all zombie on him. She puts that tent peg on his head and drives the stake through his head. And at that moment, the Bible says that, that they came looking for Sisera because he's the general and that's going to secure victory when they find the general. And so Barak comes in and finds him dead on the floor. And just as God said, a woman was going to win the victory. And so God did exactly what he said he was going to do. It is an incredible story, again, of God using unlikely people to do unlikely things. And the more unlikely the person, the greater God is going to shine through. And in this story, we've got three incredibly different, unlikely people. You've got uh, two women and one man. You've got two Jews and one Gentile. You've got in this story, you've got a prophetess, you've got a farmer and a housewife. But what I love about God is God doesn't care what culture says. God is going to use anybody. He's going to use them based on their character and based on their gifting. This is an incredible story that shows the heart of God. But what it also says to me is this, that God doesn't want to just use me. He wants to use us. Because there wasn't just one person who won the victory in this story. Yes, and we're going to talk about in a second, JL received the honor, but God uses three people. And what this says to me is that God wants to use all of us, that each and every one of us, you have a purpose, you have a plan, you have a destiny that God wants to use for his kingdom. And in this story, we see that he doesn't just use one person, he uses three unlikely people. Paul said these really important words. Paul said, there is neither Jew nor Greek, which means there is no race. Paul said there's neither slave nor free, which means there's no social status. He says there's no male or female, which means there's no gender. He said that we are all to be one in Christ Jesus. What a powerful statement. What truth. And it goes to the point that we all have a purpose. We all have a plan. And God wants to do all of us, use all of us, to do the unlikely. And so what about you? I mean, what about you? What about you in your life? And maybe right now you're thinking, man, I don't know if God could use me. I mean, I, yeah, maybe I feel unlikely, but, but I don't know if God can use me. And that's what I love about this story because who receives the honor in this story? It's JL. It is a housewife. You see, what we tend to do so many times in our lives is we look at other people and we judge them. We judge them based on, you know, what they do for a living or, or, or how they speak or their level of education or the, their level in the, in the social economic stratosphere. And we judge a person. We put their worth based on what they do or what they look like. And what we see in this story is God doesn't give a rip about that stuff. What God looks at is the character. What he looks at is the gifting and the willingness to be used, to be used for his purposes. And that's what I love about this situation. We see three people thrust into a situation that they were not planning for. And in this moment, what do they do? They just say, God, here I am, use me. Here I am, use me. And we see the incredible story unfold because God uses each of them. So how about you? How about you in your life? I mean, what would it be like for you to just say, you know what, I'm gonna grab whatever I've got and I'm just going to go and be a part of what God wants to do. You see, the truth of the matter is, when, when we say that, that's scary to us, isn't it? Be, because stepping up into that type of faith, stepping up to that type of courage, it's terrifying. Because we don't know what God is going to ask us to do. And here's the reality. I don't think any of the three people in our story today had any clue that God was going to ask them to be a part of this incredible victory. But they were willing. They were willing to step up. 
They, they said, you know what? I'm not worried about the excuses. I'm not worrying about the training. I'm not worrying about anything else. I am just going to be available to be used by God. And that's exactly what God does. It, me, and here's what's interesting to me. I think so many times in our lives, we miss opportunities to be a part of what God is doing. Because so many times we come along and we say, you know what, yeah, I don't have the training, I don't have the experience, I mean, I, I'm not good enough, I, don't, I didn't have any training you know, at a, a Bible college, or I didn't go to school for this, and so you know what, God, choose someone else. And so many times we miss those opportunities because we think, well, you know what, God can't use an unlikely person like me. And what have I said over and over and over? God uses the unlikely people to do unlikely things because the more unlikely the person, the greater he shines through. And he wants to shine through his people. And that's why I love in this story how Jael is the one who actually receives the honor. She's the one who actually gets the victory because the reality is so many times in our world, even within our church, we look and say, well, there's, there's certain people that, that can do certain things. We say, well, look at the elders or, or look at the pastor or the pastors and, and, and they're the ones that get the honor. But the truth of the matter is in the body of Christ, it's the JLs that get the honor. It, it's not the, the Baracks. It's not necessarily the Debras. It's the JLs. It's the people just like you who just grab whatever they've got, whatever God has given them, and says, hey, I'm willing to be a part of God's plan. And so maybe it's time for us to make some decisions in our life to say, I'm going to be courageous. I'm not going to make those excuses anymore. Because the truth of the matter, those excuses are always going to be there. We're going to say things like, you know what? You know, 10,000 versus one. You know what? Yeah. Why don't, I want to I just wait for the 10,000 to come and you miss an opportunity. Or maybe you go, you know what, I don't have a sword. <laughs> she didn't have a sword. She just used whatever she had. You know, she didn't need to step into this. She never had training. She wasn't a soldier. She was just a housewife. But Jael stepped in and used what she had in the moment that God gave her and brought victory to the people of Israel. And so how about you? I mean, how exciting would it be? Your life would be a roller coaster ride. Your life would be thrilling. Your life would be full of so much God-sized adventure if you just said exactly like JL said, and like, hey, I'm here. I'm going to be willing to be used by you, God. You know what I believe? I believe the Holy Spirit is in you and waiting for you to make that statement. I believe the Holy Spirit is in you waiting for you to say that so that he can get to work in you. I mean, what would it be like? How exciting would your life be? How amazing would this world be? And how much would we see God show up and do the unlikely? When all of us, all of us JLs, just said, I'm going to take whatever it is I've got, and I'm going to use it to make a difference in God's kingdom. Because the truth is this, God uses the unlikely to do unlikely things. And the more unlikely the person, the greater he shines through. Would you pray with me, church? Jesus, we thank you so much for the, this reminder. We thank you so much for, for these three unlikely people who we can relate with, who we can go, you know what? I, I can see in the story how easy it would have been to say, let somebody else do it. I mean, it would have been easy for, for Brock to say, you know what? I, I'm not a military leader. I'm not a, a general. I'm just a farmer. It would have been easy for, for, for JL to say, you know what? Just come in here and we give you something to drink and hide out until everyone's gone. It would have been easy for Deborah to say, you know what? No, Barack, you go by yourself. I'm not going to go with you. But each and every one of them put away the excuses, took whatever God opportunity was in front of them, and said, God, here I am. Use me. And so that's our prayer here today. God, we just want to pray that prayer as, as individuals. We want to pray that prayer as a church. God, here I am. Use me. Send me. Put me to work in your kingdom because we know that there is a battle that is raging out there. It is a battle that is real, a battle that is difficult, and a battle that we need to be involved in. And so wherever we may be, may we all rise up and be JLs. May we all rise up and use whatever it is that God has given us to make a difference in the kingdom of God. Jesus, we love you. Thank you so much for this encouraging word and for the challenge to be available because God uses the unlikely to do unlikely things. We love you, Jesus. 
a whole lot less of us and a whole lot more of you. It's in your name we pray, amen. So my relationship with Jesus has definitely changed over the years, I think, just like everybody else. With moving all over, I definitely uh, didn't have a chance to find a home at a church. I met Pastor Todd through a friend of mine and other people that go to church here that have just welcomed me with open arms and made life amazing and given me another family to lean on and talk to that, that share faith. I've always wanted to be a foster parent from a younger age and it's been something that has been on my heart. So I started looking up the agency that was near me and inquiring questions and finally felt I was at a place in life. My age range, I started out with zero to 10. Then I get a call from the agency going, we have this 16 year old. We know she's out of your age range, but she needs somebody. So I hemmed and hawed because you know, like I was 16. Do I wanna deal with a 16 year old? There was, a, there was a tug at my heart going, talk to her, meet her, see if there's something there. So we FaceTimed and we just kind of clicked. We hit it off and she moved in. There were days that I was like, am I doing this right? I, I don't know, like, am I, am I teaching her the right way? Am I being too lenient? Like, do I let her go do this? Do, what, what controls do I put on a 16 year old? Like, I, I didn't know got to know her and I had already heard that she had siblings, but I didn't know that they had been separated for almost two years, which I'm a family person and it broke my heart. So I started talking to the agency about what would need to happen and how I could get my house to be able to take in three more children. The gentleman that led me to Pastor Todd and my church family actually helped me put all the bunk beds together. Just having them together for the first time and then staying at my house, it was it was amazing. The first time we came to church together, I can remember everybody like just coming in and saying, hi, I'm so happy to meet all of you. Like, welcome, welcome to the family. They embraced myself and the kids open loving arms. And I'm like, we have our home. Having my 12 year old tell me that ever since she's been with me and coming to church, she's grown closer to her faith. It just made me know that I am, I'm doing right by her and that she knows she can lean on me. She can lean on her faith at any time and we will both always be there for her. The church family helped me give them the best Christmas possible. Wait, I had such a huge outpouring of love from everybody that I ran out of places to hide Christmas presents. I, I may feel alone at times, but I know I'm not alone because I've got him, I've got my friends, family, my church family. I've got so many people I can lean on and call and talk to and get support if I need it. Follow his path. He will put you in the direction you are meant to go. I believe that for me, mine was meeting my oldest foster daughter and providing her with the love and care and life she's deserved and to also bring her and her family back together. If I didn't have a grounding in my faith, I don't believe I would have had the courage to to make some of the leaps and bounds I have. I wouldn't have taken the steps I did and I don't even know if I would have taken in my 16 year old without my faith and knowing that I was doing it for the right reasons.